Hello, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday today on November 1st, 2023. My name is Melissa Haddad, and I will. The District of Durham exists on lands that the Mishisageg Nation Nishinaabe inhabited for thousands of years prior to European colonization. These lands are the, the traditional treaties of the nations covered under the Williams Treaty between the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Alderville First Nation, Hiawatha First Nation, Curb Lake First Nation, and the Chippewa Nations of the Georgina Island, Beausoleil, and Rama. Recognize, honor, and respect Indigenous peoples as rights holders and stewards of the lands and waters on which we have the privilege to live. In our efforts towards reconciliation, we continue to build and strengthen relationships with First Nations as well as the large Métis communities and growing Inuit communities here in Durham. We commit to learning with the Indigenous values and knowledge, building opportunities for collaboration, and recognizing that we are all connected. Please share in the chat the territory you are joining from. Today's webinar is Virtual Assistance for All. Leveraging Automation and Artificial Intelligence in Primary Care. This session is part of our Webinar Wednesday Healthcare Innovation Rounds series and has been certified for Main Pro Plus credit. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mohammed al -Arakia. Dr. Mohammed. Great, uh, thanks uh, very much. Uh... Melissa, and, and it's great to see everyone uh, today. This is uh, the first in our innovation series of Main Pro uh, accredited uh, sessions, and there are a number of other uh, sessions coming. So just would encourage you to attend. And, and certainly this session is for everyone, R really there to uh, hopefully have a dialogue around uh, some different things. Uh, today, we're going to focus on leveraging automation and AI in, in primary care. Uh, so I'm Mohamed Al-Rakia. Uh, again, I'm a practicing family physician in Ontario. Uh, I'm the CEO of the eHealth Center of Excellence. Uh, I'm the Faculty Digital Health and Innovation Lead at McMaster Medical School in, at the Waterloo Regional uh, Campus. It's really great to join you uh, today. Uh, I'm joined uh, by the brains of the operation, um, Justin Balting, who's a Manager of Product Development and Innovation at the eHealth Center of Excellence. And uh, he's going to be helping me out with uh, this topic and, and, uh, and the tough questions that you're going to uh, send us uh, send our way. Uh, there is a chat uh, feature and, and we'd like you to use the chat feature to send questions. Please send them throughout um, the presentation and we will answer some of them along the way and then we'll have ample time to answer them uh, at the end. Uh, this really is a, an opportunity, I think, to look at you know where should we go leveraging automation and AI and particularly in the community, which often has less support uh, than other sectors uh, in terms of moving forward with these technologies. Uh, so we'll go to the we'll go to the next slide. We wanted to just start with disclosures. Uh, so both Justin and I work for the eHealth uh, Center of Excellence, and so there is a financial uh, relationship uh, there. Um, I also sit on the board of Digital Health uh, Canada. Uh, neither of us have any patents, so we're not going to get rich uh, soon. Uh, um, and as I mentioned, we uh, we do work for the eHealth uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, when we'll tell you more about uh, the organization uh, coming up. We'll move to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, we do get funding at the Health Center of Excellence from, uh, from governments and, and government agencies and various health uh, service uh, providers. Uh, so wanted to note that. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. And um, <clears throat> in terms of conflicts, we will sort of identify them uh, throughout. Um, we, we don't, we're not making any therapeutic uh, recommendations uh, in this uh, presentation. So we'll go to the next slide. I'm just going to take a pause and just drink uh, uh, some water here. So what do we hope to achieve today? We really wanted to talk to you about digital tools that can support the reduction of administrative uh, burden. Uh, we, we're going to talk to you about a few examples of where artificial intelligence is being used in, in healthcare to, to, to um, make some tangible uh, benefits. Uh, and then what are the future opportunities around automation and artificial intelligence and where where can we go and we welcome your ideas as well I, I think there's a, a lot of activity out there on uh, automation artificial intelligence uh, and certainly there are enough problems to solve so we really want to uh, start a conversation about that and how can 
these technologies be used in, in an appropriate way to support clinicians so they can care better for, for patients. We'll move to the next slide. So just starting with some background, what is the eHealth Center of Excellence? It's a not-for-profit organization uh, that works across the country. Uh, it's supported over 10,000 uh, physicians, nurse practitioners uh, in the community uh, across the country. Uh, the expertise is uh, around a number of different things, but you know we really focus on uh, change management, uh, supporting clinicians um, with uh, you know different changes in processes so that they are able to then implement technology uh, within their practices in a way that hopefully uh, improves their life and improves the life of patients. Uh, we do evaluation, so knowledge translation and evaluation uh, of uh, digital technologies and interventions to see if they actually are making a difference uh, or not. Um, and we support um, project management uh, as well as uh, things that like you'll see today, looking at developing technology and then deploying technology uh, within the environment. Uh, we do a number of different things that you can sort of see on, on the screen um, uh, there, and we're happy to get into some of those um, as questions arise. Today, we're going to be focusing more on uh, the automated solutions and artificial intelligence. Uh, we also do cybersecurity, which is a new uh, thing that we're doing uh, across the country. That's also main pro accredited, and, and it allows uh, clinicians and their teams uh, and their staff to get up to date on um, what they need to do to protect versus uh, cyber attacks. You can get more information on the website at the bottom, and that will also be at the end. Uh, what are we? What do we do as an organization? Really, the key is to be the leading trusted digital health partner for primary care and integrated uh, care. Uh, key word is trust to to make sure that uh, we do it in a way that uh, makes sense, that is evidence based, that that um, goes in a direction that uh, helps clinicians deliver patient uh, care, and then stops doing things that are not not helpful. Um, We'll move to the next slide. So we know, you know, we know burnout is a big problem. We know technology is a a, a significant cause of uh, of burnout. Uh, family physicians uh, are spending many many hours uh, in uh, one analysis, nineteen hours on administrative work uh, per week. Uh, this is contributing clinician burnout. Uh, clinicians leaving the practice, um, and it's a shame because we don't have enough clinicians, particularly in family medicine, to support our, our patient population uh, in Ontario, uh, my home province. Uh, there are 2.2 million uh, patients uh, that don't have a family doctor and increasing uh, rapidly will be 3 million uh, over the next uh, few years. Um, we know that there are other jurisdictions that have moved forward with re reducing administrative uh, burden for, for clinicians. The NHS has moved forward with re reducing uh, administrative work to 10% uh, of a clinician's week. Uh, and Nova Scotia has set to reduce the administrative burden by 10% uh, next year. Uh, and so it really, you know, there's lots of work happening on this. There's work around, you know, things like simplifying forms, um, not making clinicians responsible for ordering tests that they don't they don't need to order, um, things they, they don't need to sign off uh, on. <clears throat> there's lots of work on team-based care, looking at how do you support patients with, with care teams, um, integrated care teams, uh, 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 interprofessional primary care teams, so that uh, the burden is not on the physician or nurse, uh, nurse practitioner. Uh, and so a lot of different things, and, and I put forward to you automation and artificial intelligence can be some of the things that uh, can reduce that admin burden on, on clinicians if we do it in a thoughtful way and if we do the right analysis to actually see if that they, that they are doing that. Uh, you know, studies have shown that clinicians or, you know, surveys have shown rather that clinicians don't think they should have zero admin burden, that there, there is some admin burden that is expected, but it, you know, it shouldn't be 40% of your time is spent on administrative uh, tasks. Uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business did an analysis uh, and they said that 18.5 million hours is, sent, is spent on unnecessary uh, paperwork uh, per year, that that's equivalent to 55 million visits. So if we're even looking at reducing that by 10%, we could have 5.5 million more visits uh, to clinicians. And of course, we want to give time back to clinicians for their own uh, health, for their family. And so there is, you know, there's an opportunity to, to tackle this, but we need to look at what are the different tools that we have that can, that can help us do that. We'll move to the next slide. So before we do that, like, I, you know, we're, I think we're, all keen to jump in and try to solve problems, we need to do so in a thoughtful way. 
And the, the way to do that is by really being empathetic about what clinicians are going through and of course what patients are going through um, to understand from the clinician perspective, you know, what are they dealing with? W what is actually happening in their in their day, in their clinic? I was in clinic this morning, you know, and, and saw patients. I had to do a number of forms and I needed to like look at lab work and diagnostic imaging and, and I was on call previously. So I had to follow up on some of those things. And so there's a lot of things coming at clinicians. And so understanding that, um, understanding what the issues are, defining exactly what the problem is, uh, is really important to to make sure one like uh, really understands the 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 problem in a clinical setting, and then thinking about what are the ideas uh, that are there that can solve that problem in a real way, and making sure you involve clinicians within uh, this entire process, and then trying things out. And I, I we will talk today about some things that we've tried tried out over the last number of years and are refining and getting better and testing it uh, in environment uh, in in the clinical environment. Then once we've done a prototype and making sure it works and then scaling and spreading. And, and that's a problem that we have in, in uh, this country is we don't scale and spread things that are working very well. And so, you know, I think we need to, to do that and need to move forward in, in doing that. What I've just talked about is an approach to design thinking. Um, Stanford uh, has published a lot on, uh, on this. They have a school around this and I encourage you to look at, go to that link and, and learn about that. I, I think we can always talk about technology, but if it's not solving the problem, at hand, the problem that's most important to those that we're implementing the technology to, uh, often it, um, it you know it leads to more burden versus less uh, less burden. Uh, Justin will uh, later talk about Heal, the approach that we've taken as an organization uh, in terms of solving problems, and we've really defined that and and are looking to do that for uh, everything that we're looking to to tackle. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. And so this, the, one of the potential solutions is AI, and I talked about empathy. And so this was a study in, in JAMA Internal Medicine that uh, looked at uh, a number of questions that patients had posed online, uh, 195 questions. And then they looked at physicians answering those questions and AI answering those questions. And uh, AI had more empathetic uh, and better quality responses as judged by healthcare professionals, right? So um, you know, there, uh, there is value to AI. Now, you know, this is a small study. There's a lot more for us to, to look at. And by no means do I think uh, I'm going to be on a beach somewhere and, and an AI bot will take my, my job. But AI can help with, with some, some of the things and can help um, with some uh, Im important tasks. And so I put forward to you, AI is, is very good at uh, summarizing information. It can take a lot of information and summarize it. So the clinician has it available. So if you have a patient with a particular particular characteristics and a particular condition, AI can give you the information that would be relevant to that patient. Um, and so then you can look at that. And, and there are a lot of things and, and hopefully we can have some discussion about, you know, what is like the looking, dealing with bias in terms of data sets and what does the AI base its decisions on. But there is a tremendous power there to summarize large bodies of information so that clinicians can have that available. The second thing AI can do is, is then you take it a step further and, and provide decision support, can say, you know, this is the next step in this pa particular patient's journey. This, this patient has heart failure. Uh, they, you know, should be on this other medication, and this is why uh, they should be on this other medication. So the the other important thing is uh, about just being transparent and understanding in a transparent way uh, why AI is suggesting something. It's not um, people talk about explainable AI where everything is explainable. Um, that has some some problems uh, with it. We we expect AI to come up with ex. Uh, Solutions that may be, there may be some other logic there that we might not fully understand, but knowing what it's using to come up with that um, answer will allow us then to do some tests and trials to see if it's coming up with the right answers or not, and in a very thoughtful way, uh, see if it's actually giving us a, a new, better perspective on, on something. And then if we are actually finding that to, uh, to move forward with larger scale implementation, we also know that artificial intelligence can drift a little bit. The models can drift over time. And so it's important for us to, to constantly be, uh, be checking in and understanding what the AI is, is, is doing. Um, but AI is here and AI is going to play a role in, in the future. And so it is, you know, what I like to uh, refer to it as is augmented intelligence. AI just allows us 
as clinicians to have the information available, understand some factors that we might not be thinking about, and then make a decision between us and the patient. So maintaining that patient clinician relationship. So it's a, it's a tool like any other tool that will allow us to uh, hopefully improve patient care if it's implemented in, in an appropriate way. And I think there's a lot more work to do on, on looking at what that exactly means. I'll, I'll talk about one example uh, about, uh, about how we're uh, looking to use AI. So uh, Justin, if you go on to the next slide. So this is the example. So, so we have deployed an electronic referral system. Uh, we're supporting a number of provinces with, uh, with uh, this. Uh, electronic referral is really about taking this uh, you know, really challenging process where you know, I'm seeing a patient, I'm trying to get patient to the next service. I'm trying to get a patient uh, to an ear, nose, throat doctor, for an example. And, you know, it's often hard to know where to start. I, I will start with, you know, the clinician that I know down the street and I'd refer, but what if that clinician's wait time is like a year and then there's another clinician, maybe you know, 20 minutes away that their, their wait time is, is three months. You know, right now it's just a shot in the dark. You're referring patients off and you're trying to sort of do the best you can, but you only know what you know. And so, you know, taking that process right now, which is largely facts based and digitizing it, um, presents some opportunities with understanding, you know, what services are available, all the specialists that are available, uh, understanding the wait times in real time, uh, the patient understanding those things and being able to follow their referral, um, uh, you know, like a, like they would a package online. So there's some opportunity, uh, some benefits of digitizing the referral process, but there's still, you know, some challenges with respect uh, to that. And so can AI help uh, with that? So we'll go to the next slide. And uh, there's a bunch of animation here, so I'll let Justin click through it while I'm I'm talking. Is is that, um, you know, if I'm looking at referring a patient to uh, a specialty, and say, you know, there is a number of different special specialists that are available, what what can we predict, or can we predict how long a patient would take to get to that specialist? So sort of like if you use Waze or you use Google Maps, and you're looking to go to a particular destination, you're going to get different routes in that destination. And so what we've been able to do with referral is because we capture the data electronically in terms of referrals, is we've been able to use AI models, even before a patient is referred, to tell you what the expected wait time is for the different specialists. So we've got different data about the patient, uh, we've got data about the specialists and about wait times, and then we use that to say, this patient with moderate osteoarthritis and heart failure has this potential wait time for these different specialists. And this would be the best wait time for uh, for that sort of patient. And this is where you should refer them. It might be farther away, um, but that's gonna be the shortest wait time. And then there's a conversation with the patient about whether they want that uh, wait time uh, or not. Uh, and so there's different things that are, are moving here where like this is where the specialists are um, separate and you would refer them to individually. There's there's a central intake uh, that are, are happening across the country where you would then, the central intake could use something like this where it could look at, you know, which specialist would be the next one uh, that we would send the patient to in a more automated way versus having a person actually look at that and, uh, and, and do that. So, you know, artificial intelligence in this case has a role for helping to navigate the patient through a system to understand the services and what services are more easily accessible uh, to the patient or fa faster to a patient. And then again, it, it is about the patient uh, still having choice of who they want to see, uh, where, which geography they want to go to. Uh, but this will support the conversation between a clinician and a patient where you can actually then say, okay, here, this is the predicted wait time. The actual, you know, this is what we actually think is going to happen. Is that okay for you? Um, what happens today is you send a referral off and you get either an, a note rejecting a referral saying, okay, the wait time, we, we can't tell you yet, or the wait time maybe is like 12 months. Um, is that okay? And then you have that, you have to do back and forth after the fact. This way, right at the point of referral, you can uh, determine how long it is. So AI has a, has a role in helping you to predict what, what something might happen and then having that conversation. AI can also help with what services would this patient need? So as a clinician, um, you know, I, I get thrown lots of information about different services in the community and in hospital that a patient could benefit from, but I can't keep all of that 
in track in my brain for patients with you know hundreds of conditions can ai actually summarize that and say this patient would benefit from these three services that are available in the community they meet the criteria for uh, they it seems to fit with their profile so then i can again talk to the patient and say you know these are the things that uh, you would actually benefit uh, from. So that's some 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 work that we're thinking about doing moving moving forward. Um, and you know, I think again, we'll present an opportunity to look at how do we maximize the resources in the community um, that are available that we might not know about, and and you know, extends the clinician's brain by giving the clinician um, oh, uh, additional uh, um, information. Now, someone's lost uh, the audio. Can you guys hear me? Okay, Justin. Michelle, okay, you can. Okay, so it might be on, on your end. Um, so just uh, hopefully that can get uh, uh, sorted out. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Justin, and he's going to uh, do the next part of the of the deck. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. And as Mohammed mentioned, my name is Justin Walting, um, and I'm going to talk about a number of different components uh, today for the rest of the presentation. Uh, but I will start with automation technology uh, and something called robotic process automation and, and tell you all the different exciting work that uh, we're doing here at the L Center of Excellence. Um, and so starting really from the beginning here, um, you may have heard the term robotic process automation or intelligent automation or software robots and might have wondered, what is this? And really quite simply what this is, um, is it's referred to as a robot or robot and it replicates the actions of a human that would actually be interacting with the digital system. And so if you think about a human that might be going into an EMR system, running a search, finding patients, doing follow-up actions, um, you're running reports, all of those different types of actions within the EMR, um, we can actually program a bot to do those automatically in the background. And so with being able to do that, there are a number of benefits from the use of this type of technology, um, which a few of them are here, which are worth highlighting, uh, including that bots can basically run 24-7, 365, because they don't need to do things like eat, sleep, eat and sleep. Um, they work with existing infrastructure so that we don't need to be building sort of complex um, interfaces between systems. Uh, the bots can actually use existing technologies like a VPN software that employees would actually already be set up. You can actually set up a bot in a very similar way to access a system. Um, Mohammed had mentioned kind of, you know, the, 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 the this type of technology is really supplemental and, and these bots are the same in that they complement clinician work. Uh, they can work in the backgrounds, they can communicate with clinicians, they can do things kind of and, and helping them along the way. Um, and then support employees. Um, bots are really fantastic at being able to take on um, some of that administrative burden, which Muhammad also spoke about. Uh, and we'll get into some of the details about that uh, in the coming slides. And so there, again, are a number of benefits from using this type of technology. And we've just sort of highlighted just a few of them that are here. And the list goes kind of on and on. Uh, they can do things like being able to create alerts and reminders directly within the EMR that integrate right into clinician workflows. Uh, it can really reduce the amount of time that you need to record your data and analyze data. Uh, bots are really good at being able to go in and aggregate, collect, and present data in a very you know, concise and digestible way. Um, bots are able to do all of that background work uh, in terms of being able to identify patients that are in needs of services. Uh, and in the case of one bot that we're going to get to, can actually perform that outreach automatically. Um, it can engage with patients in its, uh, you know, a number of ways to that point uh, in terms of you know, including things like surveys, questionnaires, forms, messages, and things like that. Um, and then really importantly, bots in terms of that identification can actually find patients that are at risk. It can find them early um, because they can work in that background and we can continuously looking for patients that are at risk for a number of different things uh, like uh, certain diseases um, or patients that are at risk. Um, for maybe even things like hospitalization or ED visits. And so what I'd like to introduce to you, if you haven't already seen it before, um, is that we do um, support clinicians with automation, and we actually have our own department here called ECE Automates, um, really, which is all about developing these bots or these virtual assistants, as they're also known as, too. And so uh, this is our family, we call them the family of bots. Uh, and I'm actually gonna go into pretty, uh, pretty high, well, lots of detail on each of the bots and how they work. 
And um, as you can see, we've actually named the bots, which is very fun. And um, we've actually also named the bots in a way where uh, it kind of describes a little bit about what each bot does. Uh, and for example, you'll see Cody on the screen here, um, which is really a stance for coding, helping coding the EMR and help with data standardization, uh, which we'll get into. Um, and just want to highlight that um, this has been work we've, we've been working with work with over 500 clinicians across the province and over 65 clinics at that point, um, really looking to spread and scale a lot of the work that's been done here, like Mohammed had mentioned, uh, but we're also developing new bots as well. And we'll get into some of that work a little bit later in the presentation. And so, like I mentioned, I will go into some pretty good detail about how these bots actually work. So you can visualize this a little bit and how this might actually look in your practice. And so what you'll see over the next few slides are really kind of a little diagram of how the bot works. And you can think of it of kind of moving from left to right in terms of how the bot actually works. And so, um, like I had previously mentioned, uh, the first bot that we'll talk about is our Cody bot. Uh, to me, which is really a kind of a foundational bot that really enables a lot of different type of work. Um, but really kind of to summarize it, uh, our Cody bot is able to help with data standardization and cleanup um, through the standardization of coding patient diagnoses in the EMR in the problem list. And so what this allows is to be able to basically for 18 different conditions, be able to have standard coding within that problem list. Um, so that you're able to identify these different patient populations much easier than just running your search and hoping that you're able to um, look through free text and things like that. And so the way that our bot works is that the bot connects remotely to the EMR using secure methods like a VPN. Uh, it will run a search for a specific condition such as diabetes, and it will look for patients that have not previously been coded, but have the word diabetes or have a certain A1C in a certain range, things like that, that you know, the, the bot suspects needs coding. The bot will then actually go chart by chart and it will open each one and it will go and it will find that entry that said diabetes or a different variation of it. Um, and it will actually add either the ICD-9 or SNOMED CT code, depending on which coding system your, your clinic may use. It'll actually add that directly into there. It will then generate a report at the end of the run um, that you can look through and it'll actually send messages directly within the EMR to the clinician or to an, uh, someone else at the actual site um, on a patient by patient basis so you can see exactly what the bot was able to do. And so we'll run this for 18 different conditions and at the end what you have um, is uh, for these 18 conditions your whole patient population is coded. So as I mentioned these are the 18 conditions on the left hand side here. Uh, we are also working on adding more conditions into this list as well. Uh, on the right-hand side, under step number two, you'll see that someone had, in this case, had put hypertension uh, in free text, and below in the middle there, or a little lower, is where the bot actually added 401, the ICD-9 code. And then our bot is actually able to do things like put in a custom form or put in information directly into the patient chart that a clinician can then interface with. And this is something that's totally completely optional, but if a clinician is interested, uh, you'll see this form at the bottom of this slide right here where the form goes into the charts and it can say for this patient exactly for what condition it ran for, if it did actually end up coding the condition and with what code and when, and then it will actually tell you why this patient was picked up. And that gets a little bit to what Muhammad had mentioned earlier around the explainability and why this patient was picked up and why they were coded. Um, this type of form here can show, you know, this patient had a certain lab maybe in that range, or there was a text match, and in this case, there was an exact text match, and that's why this bot had, uh, had picked up this patient. And then a clinician can actually type into those response comments, which is highlighted at the bottom there, and the bot can actually look at that on the next run and interface with that. So there's a bit of an asynchronous communication that can happen back and forth between the bots and the clinician as well. So that's really the bot kind of from the start to the finish, but then how do we use the bot and how do we kind of build that into some more complex and bigger types of um, work? And so uh, one example of a project that we had done was around um, doing some population segmentation with data using the Cody bot, but then using a number of other components as well. And so what this, um, this project that we had worked on was again, using the Cody bot, 
was then also bringing in some social determinants of health work and then running complex patient algorithms that were actually finding patients that were at risk for ED visits or hospitalization. And the bot and the algorithms were actually able to identify patients that were medically complex, socially complex, and both. And we were able to then be able to provide um, some information to clinicians or to different um, sites, and they could actually get, receive these lists and have this information. Um, and then they would be able to kind of leverage some of their own internal systems within their OHT or their family health team uh, and provide that proactive management for these patients. So being able to reach out early and, and create a referral or refer to a different program or things like that. And so this was an example where we took a bot and we took some other components as well and combined it all together um, to help really to help find complex patients and do that. So bots are really great at being able to work together and work with other types of functions in order to kind of achieve even a, even a higher purpose. So that was our Cody bot that we had had. Uh, our next bot that we're gonna talk about is our Bernie bot. And our Bernie bot was named because it's trying to reduce burnout. And what you'll notice for this Bernie bot is that uh, it has a number of different functionalities that all kind of go into that theme of trying to avoid burnout. And so just like the Cody bot, I'll talk in pretty in good detail about how each one of these works as well. And so the first function of our Bernie bot um, is that it's able to find patients that are due for a visit for, for diabetic patients that are due for a visit and can also identify missed billing opportunities for patients. And so this is a great bot that actually builds off of the Cody bot. So after you've coded your diabetic population, you can then run this Bernie um, diabetes bot where you can actually um, run a search for all your diabetic patients. And you can see in the past 12 months, how many visits that they've come into the office for. And you can identify how many times they've been billed for K03As and Q040As. And then from there, there are a few different permutations for then um, some different follow-up actions that could be done. So if the patients might be due for another diabetic visit because they'd only been seen once in the past 12 months. Um, they may be, maybe they've had all their visits and they are missing a few billings so some K030s. Uh, or maybe they've actually been billed for all their K030s, but they're now eligible for their Q040. And so what happens is the bot can take all of those different scenarios. It can basically generate a summary message uh, and be able to then send that to somebody at the site to say for this patient, they need this many visits and they are due for this many billings. And really what that's being able to do is really the two components that mentioned is that it, this is providing proactive care to make sure that patients are coming in and, and following best practices, uh, being seen three or four times a year. And also just making sure that there aren't any misfilling opportunities along the way for the clinician as well. Our second uh, function of our Bernie bots uh, was some work that we had uh, received. We received a CMA Jewel grants. Um, and so this was some enhanced functionality. And this was able to do a somewhat similar piece, but what it is, what this bot can do is actually identify patients that are due for different lab work and make sure that the lab has actually been done. And so the way that this bot works is that it will again connect to the EMR. It can then, it goes through your patient population and it will look for different medications um, that need certain lab testing. So for medication A, it might need lab testing X, Y, and Z. Um, and it will go through all of the different medications and it will, for all those different lab tests, it will see whether they're overdue and whether that they've been done in a frequency that's been um, set by the clinician. And for any lab value or for any lab that has not been done in that time period, what the bot can actually do is fill out a lab requisition and then it can put that directly in the chart and then it can message the clinician to say, this patient is overdue for um, these different labs and a lab requisition is in the chart. And then it's, there, it's then easily able to be sent to the patient right there. And so um, our, our next steps that we would do with this bot is able to actually automate kind of that outreach part of it. But the bot does really the heavy lifting in terms of understanding for all of the medications that this patient is taking, which lab tests are overdue. And sometimes there are overlap between those pieces and sometimes depending on the medication, even there's sometimes different frequencies and all of that can be customized uh, by the clinician as well on a, on a run basis. 
And then finally, our last function within our Bernie bot is our Bernie COVID vaccine bot. And um, this is a bot that uh, a couple of years ago uh, was one where we had responded to um, a, a very increased need. Um, and it, people may be aware that uh, as vaccines were coming in kind of in the early days, uh, they were coming in via HRM into the charts. Uh, but the big problem was that that information was then just sitting in the charts as free text and was not going into the proper immunization section, which made being able to identify the different patient populations of patients that had no shots or one or two or more uh, very difficult. And so this bot had a really a primary purpose in being able to go into the chart, be able to find the information of vaccine information that came from HRM and then put that information into the immunization section, just like anyone would actually type it in. And so the bot would go in, it would run a search to find all these different patients, extract the HRM information that it found. It would then compare it to the immunizations that were already done in the immunization list. And it was already entered, it would say, great. And if it wasn't, then it would actually go in and enter each piece of information in. And what was fantastic about this uh, at the time as well, when it was such a burden to um, clinicians and to administrative staff to actually enter this in every time, uh, what we had seen was that uh, really only the minimum amount of information from these vaccines were actually going into the immunization section because uh, it was so much work. So things like some of the different adverse effects or the um, aware, you know, other components that uh, some other comments and things like that that were part of that HRM report, um, if it wasn't being done by the bot, was sometimes not reflected in that immunization section. And so the bot was able to take all that information and enter all that in automatically in the background. Uh, which was also kind of improving that data quality and standardization as well. And I will just highlight that there is a video demo for this as well. Uh, it is noted at the bottom here. And I would encourage um, everyone to, uh, so this is a link to one of our videos under our YouTube channel. Uh, we do have a number of videos for other things as well. So I encourage people to look at that. Uh, but if you're interested in looking at how this bot works directly, um, please follow this link here. And it's only about three or four minutes so you can see exactly how the bot is doing its work. So our second last bot we have here is our Sharon bots. And um, for those with a, a kind of a keen eye and have been thinking ahead, um, this is a bot around sharing information. And specifically in this case, what our Sharon bot does is it's actually sharing information from the coordinated care plan or the shared care plan between primary care and home and community care. And so this one is a little bit more complex in terms of the data flow and how it works. But what you can see here is what the bot is able to do. Um, and actually maybe I'll start with kind of the, the core problem here. And so what was happening is that coordinated care plans um, were being filled out by both primary care and home and community care in two separate systems. And so when a you know, care plan was updated in one system, what was happening without the use of a bot is that that information was then faxed or there was an email or something like that trying to communicate to the other side. Uh, but it was very difficult to then be able to take that information and update it in both sides and keep things in sync. And what ended up happening is that this process would break down and people would not use it. And so what the bot is able to do is able to basically be able to look into both systems and see both of the care plans. And when an update is made, it can look at both and it can synchronize information. And so the way that this works is that the bot will start in primary care EMR and it will look for patients that have a care plan and any updates to a care plan. It will then be able to go into the HPG or health partner gateway system, which is on the home and community care side. We'll find that same patient and find that version of the coordinated care plan. It can look at each of the different sections and it can see the date and timestamps from when each one was updated. And based off of all that information, it can then actually update the care plan on both sides. So it's bilateral or bi-directional um, updating. So really the end result that you get from this bot is the same information in both sides. And similar to our other bots, the bot will able, be able to send either like an email or it can send a, an internal EMR message uh, also to the clinician or to somebody at the site saying, this information, or this patient had an update to their care plan, uh, please go take a look and see. Um, but solving a really big problem with different, these different siloed systems that need information shared. So this is, this is how our Sharon bot works right now. 
And then finally, um, our Poppy bot, which I'm very excited uh, to talk about a little today, uh, is really our newest bot that we have. And um, this is a bot that was designed in collaboration with the East Toronto Health Partners OHT. Uh, and this bot is all about being able to help with uh, preventative care cancer screening. And so, um, as we know, through the pandemic, um, there were many patients kind of had kind of fallen through the cracks um, due to everything else and, and really are very much overdue for their different screenings. And so our Poppy bot is able to actually identify who these patients are, but then it can actually go a step further and it will go and it will be able to then segment and stratify these patients in different groups. So it can do things like patients that are very, very overdue uh, and maybe live in a high priority neighborhood would go into a much higher priority in terms of needing outreach and needing their cancer screening as, to, you know, as opposed to patients that maybe are just, you know, a month overdue and don't have some of those different factors. And so that's where the bot's able to do the back end work to be able to stratify these different types of patients. Um, and then what's really fantastic about this bot is it actually can do the outreach part and those next actions for patients as well. And so if a patient is identified as needing their colorectal uh, screening done, their fit test, uh, the bot can actually fill out the fit test, the fit requisition on behalf of the clinician. It can put it into the chart and then it can actually fax it directly to Life Labs. And then the pet bot after that can then send an ocean secure message to the patient and from and then saying that the fit test has been ordered and they should be receiving. So the bot can actually communicate directly with patients as well. Uh, another example that we have is our PAP workflow. Um, and so what the, the bot is able to integrate with things like the um, online appointment booking. So if a patient is identified as needing their pap smear done, um, they can get an ocean secure message. And in that message, it will actually have an online appointment booking link where they can kind of fill things out. Um, they can book an appointment that meets the needs, but it just shows how the automation kind of work within different workflows that already exist. And so we've seen really, really fantastic results on this. Uh, we just started this bot earlier this year um, and um, are excited for this to kind of be, um, continue to be adopted by more and more teams across the province. So in addition to some of the bots that we've developed, you know, kind of what's next on some other components? And I think this is a really exciting one. Um, so you may have heard of something, digital scribes, ambient scribes, AI scribes. Um, really the idea behind this is um, that this is a different type of technology where instead of having to, for an encounter for a clinician that needs to be typing everything out and looking at the screen while you know, hearing everything from a patient, um, what this software, uh, what this technology is able to do is actually, you know, through a microphone and through the technology, be able to listen to a full encounter, it can capture the whole thing, and then it can actually create the encounter notes in soap note or in other ways and that documentation and then directly put it into the EMR. So this way, this actually improves both the clinician and the patient experience where they can just have a conversation and the technology in the background does the work. And then the clinician can then add notes or things afterwards. Um, but being able to reduce this type of this many keystrokes and typing and be able to have a, a note generated right into the chart can, uh, saves an absolute a ton of time there. And then really we can even take it a step further from there once there's a clinical note in the chart generated by the software where we can have automated tools then taking the next actions based off of that encounter. So for example, a patient may, be, may come in and one of the next steps identified by the clinician is that there is a, an e-referral completed from there. And the bot can actually go in and do that work and can create the e-referral after that. So again, an example of um, the technology being able to work together uh, with other types of technology uh, in order kind of from the end-to-end -end workflow to improve um, and, and reduce some of that administrative burden. So Mohammed had mentioned um, the earlier the HEAL lab that we have. And uh, while we have spoken about a lot of really exciting technology that we can uh, implement to help improve things, it really does start with in the beginning and making sure that we are really understanding the problem and we are applying a co-design approach and, and a design thinking approach to anything that we do. And so we have a, a something called our HEAL lab, which is our healthcare experience and advancement lab. 
uh, where we actually bring clinicians and others together. And we start at the very beginning with what are the problems that we're seeing? And how do I identify you know, what those are and maybe some different solutions um, from there instead of just thinking about what technology necessarily can be applied? We start from the other way around. Uh, and so it, with our lab that we have here, uh, we actually have engaged a number of clinicians and something that we had overwhelmingly heard was that the inbox within the EMR is a huge um, pain point for administrative burden. There's just too many messages, too much duplication, um, too many um, messages that need to, that don't actually need to be read but are coming in. And so we're actually working on something that can help with that with some automation. And so um, stay tuned for more information, but we are excited to be able to talk a little bit more later in the year about um, a bot that's able to help with those exactly. Um, in terms of being able to actually uh, get um, get involved with our HEAL lab, uh, we welcome everybody to reach out uh, if you're interested in being part of our different sessions. Um, they're short sessions that can kind of work with your schedule um, and we really want to hear from you and, and apply that co-design thinking. Um, please see the email or the link at the bottom of the um, of this slide right here and able to learn a little bit more about our HEAL lab uh, and, and sign up and be a part of it moving forward. So we're getting a little towards the end of the presentation here. And so just leaving you with a few different uh, key takeaways here. Um, don't need to go through each one of these necessarily uh, in depth, but what you've seen are really a number of different technologies that can really help uh, with the administrative burden and decrease that administrative effort. Um, different uh, solutions like AI and automation and ambient scribes, they can all work together uh, to do things like share information, uh, to clean up um, some of the data and your and, and systems like your EMR in the background, um, be able to decrease that administrative effort to free up your primary care team, and really being able to help support integrated care and population health management, um, you know, either through the early identification of complex patients or, or being able to automatically connect to patients for some of those different outreach mechanisms um, that can take staff and clinicians a long time. So, so many different benefits. Um, and as the, the more and more that we're developing bots and getting out there, the more um, potential and, and different things that we can do. Just a quick note on some EMR availability. Uh, we do need to train the bots so that they can interface with the different systems. And so uh, at the moment right now, our bots primarily work in TELUS PS suites. Uh, we are we do have one bot or Cody bot available within Oscar um, and Oscar Pro. Uh, and we are exploring and um, having some of our bots available in a cure QHR as well soon. So we're wanting to have all the bots available um, in their form here uh, in all the different EMRs soon. And so thank you. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to um, all the different great, exciting work that's happening. I uh, encourage you to, to look at our website, ehealthca.ca, for some more information, or you can contact info at ehealthca. Um, as well, if you have any other questions. Um, if you are interested in getting started with any other tools, you can also see the QR code uh, that's there. And even though you can't see that link, we can get you that link as well um, if you are not able to access the QR code. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I know we have uh, five minutes. Is that uh, right, Melissa? Yeah, okay, so we have five minutes left. I think I've answered almost every question in the chat um, and the Q&A. So, uh, but there are there are a few themes and there are a few sort of final questions. So I, I think um, uh, there's a question about replacing physician assistants. Uh, I love our physician assistants and our team. We're not gonna replace anyone. I think we have a, a, a challenge in terms of health human resources, and this is really to supplement the team and support the team members so they can see more patients and serve more patients and not not burn out. So that's really what the intent is. I think a great point about uh, patient co-design, like we have generally had the solutions facing clinicians. And so we've co-designed with, with clinicians, but as we do more of these facing patients and communicating to patients, that patient co-design is very important. We, we do that for a number of different initiatives, but in this one, you know, we've focused on more of the clinician up to, up to this point in time. Um, to, to error proof solutions. So David asked about error proofing solutions. You know, we've been doing this for the number of years and we, it's just like, you know, we are very um, uh, conservative in terms of what the, the bots can do and, and test and test and test and make sure that clinicians review that um, so that uh, we are not making errors. Um, there's a lot of things that can be automated 
and you can use AI on that are, are simple, simple to solve. We don't have to get so complicated. Uh, lots of questions about um, interoperability and EMRs and, and maybe just to summarize that. Um, <clears throat> the EMRs are users. So it's like me learning a new system. You give me a, a username and password, I can get into that, I can get into any EMR. Give me a username and password, I can get into any EM, EMR. But then it's about training the uh, how to use the EMR. So just like you would train me uh, in terms of using an EMR, you have to train the bot in terms of how to use the EMR. So they don't need permission of a vendor to get in. They can just get in like a user and they can do certain tasks just like you or a staff person uh, would do. And so they don't need any fancy hooks. Now they can, like you can use APIs and they can plug in that way, but I would just think of them simply as uh, a user with a username and password. It's a person sitting beside you on a computer getting into the system. So they can be trained for any system and get into any system and and do the work. Um, Mohammed, can I jump in um, while you're going sure. those? Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to highlight um, that privacy and security isn't something maybe we spoke about directly today, but really privacy and security are paramount and are absolutely critical in, in, in this and something that we, like Mohammed mentioned, we're, pretty, we're very conservative and make sure that we are doing everything from that best practice standpoint. Uh, and we have uh, a, a privacy and security team that we engage with through from the very beginning all the way to the end of any of our processes. Uh, we've gone through privacy impact assessment, threat risk assessments, uh, worked with Ontario Health, worked with other organizations, uh, making sure that everything that we're doing is following those best practices. Um, some of the benefits from the bot actually having its own VPN or, and EMR account is that everything is fully auditable using the systems that a human would access as well. So if I access a system remotely in an EMR and I open up a patient chart and do something, it's recorded that I did that, that will say Justin accessed this and did this on this date. And a bot is exactly the same way. So you can audit everything that the bot can do, looking through all of it using existing systems. And then we have our own reports and systems as well to make sure that every step of the way we can see what the bots are doing. So full transparency, full privacy and security are absolutely critical. And that's something that we have by design in design with all of our tools. Yeah, thanks Justin uh, very much for that. Uh, there's a question about how long does it take to train a bot? Are they, fa are they faster than me or slower than me in terms of being trained? Uh, well, what, the, what's great about it is that the bots um, might take a little time in the beginning, but then they're they're, they're very fast at being able to be trained. Um, so what happens is, is that our bots, when we develop them, I think of them as building blocks. So like a bot is able to log into the EMR, it can go and open up a form, it can run a search. Uh, you teach them to do that once. And then when you tell the, ask the bot next time, can you please open up a search and do this? It can do it very, very fast. And so what you might actually notice in some of the demo videos and things like that is that sometimes it happens so fast and you have to go back and actually kind of rewind to see sometimes what it does because the bots are so quick. Um, and so they are, they can be trained rapidly and they can actually perform the actions much quicker than a human can as well. Yeah. And then, so we're going to, we're going to wrap up. I know there's a, a, a few sort of uh, other questions. Uh, you can, uh, the email, if you contact the email on the uh, the slide, we will make sure to respond, uh, get it to the right person and uh, respond. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, hand it back uh, to Melissa to, to uh, close us off. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all the questions, engagement, and, and uh, you know, we're happy to, uh, to get any further questions. I hope you all enjoyed this informative webinar. I'm blown away. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Alarakia and Justin for this in very informative presentation. Uh, just watching the chat, I think everybody is absolutely on this and blown away completely. Um, I'm going to launch a satisfaction uh, um, poll. Uh, if everybody could just take a moment answer. That would be lovely. Don't worry, you won't hurt our feelings if uh, if it's not that great. So please, yeah, share it, share the honest truth. And uh, we're always willing to improve and make things better.
looks like that. Thank you very much for everybody who has answered. And before I continue, so the we have launched our community platform. Uh, we did that earlier on this uh, last month, actually, uh, at the beginning of October. I encourage all the members to log on and join or start a discussion. All webinar Wednesday recordings are now located in that community platform. Uh, so we much appreciate it to get some feedback and uh, please continue on and discuss. And we have a couple of events coming up. Driving the Future, of, uh, is, which is a virtual event that is happening on Wednesday next week. Uh, you can still register for that. We also have the breakfast in Saskatchewan on November 14th. And as I said, this is part of the healthcare innovation uh, innovation rounds. And this is just the first. The next one is November 22nd. And after that is December 6th. Uh, again, I thank everybody for joining. And I do hope that you have taken away a lot of information. And I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you so very much, Dr. Alarakia and Justin. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.